History of England, Chapter Seven, Part Nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Robin Cotter, July two thousand seven. History of England from the accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay, Chapter Seven, Part Nine. While Burnet was William's secretary for English affairs in Holland, Dykvelt had been not less usefully employed in London. Dykvelt was one of a remarkable class of public men, who, having been bred to politics in the noble school of John de Witt, had, after the fall of that great minister, thought that they should best discharge their duty to the Commonwealth by rallying round the Prince of Orange. In the service of the United Provinces none was, in dexterity, temper, and manners, superior to Dykvelt. In knowledge of English affairs none seems to have been his equal. A pretense was found for dispatching him, early in the year 1687, to England on a special mission with credentials from the States-General. But in truth his embassy was not to rule the government, but to the opposition, and his conduct was guided by private instructions which had been drawn by Burnett and approved by William. Dykvelt reported that James was bitterly mortified by the conduct of the prince and princess. Quote, my nephew's duty, said the king, is to strengthen my hands, but he has always taken a pleasure in crossing me. Unquote. Dykvelt answered that in matters of private concern his highness had shown, and was ready to show, the greatest deference to the king's wishes, but that it was scarcely reasonable to expect the aid of a Protestant prince against the Protestant religion. The king was silenced, but not appeased. He saw with ill-humour, which he could not disguise, that Dykvelt was mustering and drilling all the various divisions of the opposition with a skill which would have been creditable to the ablest English statesman, and which was marvellous in a foreigner. The clergy were told that they would find the prince a friend to episcopacy and to the book of common prayer. The nonconformists were encouraged to expect from him not only toleration, but also comprehension. Even the Roman Catholics were conciliated, and some of the most respectable among them declared, to the king's face, that they were satisfied with what Dykvelt proposed, and that they would rather have a toleration secured by statute than an illegal and precarious ascendancy. The chiefs of all the important sections of the nation had frequent conferences in the presence of the dexterous envoy. At these meetings the sense of the Tory party was chiefly spoken by the earls of Danby and Nottingham. Though more than eight years had elapsed since Danby had fallen from power, his name was still great among the old cavaliers of England, and many even of those Whigs who had formerly persecuted him were now disposed to admit that he had suffered for faults not his own, and that his zeal for the prerogative though it had often misled him, had been tempered by two feelings which did him honour, zeal for the established religion, and zeal for the dignity and independence of his country. He was also highly esteemed at The Hague, where it was never forgotten that he was the person who, in spite of the influence of France and of the Papists, had induced Charles to bestow the hand of the Lady Mary on her cousin. Daniel Finch, Earl of Nottingham, a nobleman whose name will frequently recur in the history of three eventful reigns, sprang from a family of unrivalled forensic eminence. One of his kinsmen had borne the seal of Charles I, had prostituted eminent parts and learning to evil purposes, and had been pursued by the vengeance of the commons of England, with Falkland at their head. A more honourable renown had in the succeeding generation been obtained by Heneage Finch. He had immediately after the Restoration been appointed Solicitor General. He had subsequently risen to be Attorney General, Lord Keeper, Lord Chancellor, Baron Finch, and Earl of Nottingham. Through this prosperous career he always held the prerogative as high as he honestly or decently could, but he had never been concerned in any machinations against the fundamental laws of the realm. In the midst of a corrupt court he had kept his personal integrity unsullied, 
he had enjoyed high fame as an orator, though his diction, formed on models anterior to the civil wars, was, towards the close of his life, pronounced stiff and pedantic by the wits of the rising generation. In Westminster Hall he is still mentioned with respect as the man who first educed out of the chaos, anciently called by the name of equity, a new system of jurisprudence, as regular and complete as that which is administered by the judges of the common law. A considerable part of the moral and intellectual character of this great magistrate had descended with the title of Nottingham to his eldest son. This son, Earl Daniel, was an honourable and virtuous man, though enslaved by some absurd prejudices, and though liable to strange fits of caprice, he cannot be accused of having deviated from the path of right in search either of unlawful gain or of unlawful pleasure. Like his father he was a distinguished speaker, impressive but prolix, and too monotonously solemn. The person of the orator was in perfect harmony with his oratory. His attitude was rigidly erect, his complexion so dark that he might have passed for a native of a warmer climate than ours, and his harsh features were composed to an expression resembling that of a chief mourner at a funeral. It was commonly said that he looked rather like a Spanish grandee than like an English gentleman. The nicknames of Dismal, Don Dismalo, and Don Diego were fastened on him by jesters, and are not yet forgotten. He had paid much attention to the science by which his family had been raised to greatness, and was, for a man born to rank and wealth, wonderfully well read in the laws of his country. He was a devoted son of the church, and showed his respect for her in two ways, not usual among those lords who in his time boasted that they were her especial friends, by writing tracts in defense of her dogmas, and by shaping his private life according to her precepts. Like other zealous churchmen, he had, till recently, been a strenuous supporter of monarchical authority. But to the policy which had been pursued since the suppression of the Western insurrection, he was bitterly hostile, and not the less so because his younger brother, Heneage, had been turned out of the office of Solicitor General for refusing to defend the King's dispensing power. With these two great Tory earls was now united Halifax, the accomplished chief of the Trimmers. Over the mind of Nottingham, indeed, Halifax appears to have had at this time a great ascendancy. Between Halifax and Danby there was an enmity which began in the court of Charles, and which, at a later period, disturbed the court of William, but which, like many other enmities, remained suspended during the tyranny of James. The foes frequently met in the councils held by Dykvelt, and agreed in expressing dislike of the policy of the government, and reverence for the Prince of Orange. The different characters of the two statesmen appeared strongly in their dealings with the Dutch envoy. Halifax showed an admirable talent for disquisition, but shrank from coming to any bold and irrevocable decision. Danby, far less subtle and eloquent, displayed more energy, resolution, and practical sagacity. Several eminent Whigs were in constant communication with Dykvelt, but the heads of the great houses of Cavendish and Russell could not take quite so active and prominent a part as might have been expected from their station and their opinions. The fame and fortunes of Devonshire were at that moment under a cloud. He had an unfortunate quarrel with the court, arising not from a public and honourable cause, but from a private brawl in which even his warmest friends could not pronounce him altogether blameless. He had gone to Whitehall to pay his duty, and had there been insulted by a man named Culpepper, one of a set of bravos, who invested the purlius of the court, and who attempted to curry favour with the government by affronting members of the opposition. The king himself expressed great indignation at the manner in which one of his most distinguished peers had been treated under the royal roof, and Devonshire was pacified by an intimation that the offender should never again be admitted into the palace. The interdict, however, was soon taken off. The earl's resentment revived. His servants took up his cause. Hostilities such as seemed to belong to a ruder age disturbed the streets of Westminster. The time of the Privy Council was occupied by the criminations and recriminations of the adverse parties. 
Coldpepper's wife declared that she and her husband went in danger of their lives, and that their house had been assaulted by ruffians in the Cavendish livery. Devonshire replied that he had been fired at from Coldpepper's windows. This was vehemently denied. A pistol, it was owned, loaded with gunpowder, had been discharged, but this had been done in a moment of terror, merely for the purpose of alarming the guards. While this feud was at the height, the Earl met Coldpepper in the drawing-room at Whitehall, and fancied that he saw triumph and defiance in the bully's countenance. Nothing unseemly passed in the royal sight, but, as soon as the enemies had left the presence-chamber, Devonshire proposed that they should instantly decide their dispute with their swords. The challenge was refused. Then the high-spirited peer forgot the respect which he owed to the place where he stood, and to his own character, and struck Coalpepper in the face with a cane. All classes agreed in condemning this act as most indiscreet and indecent. Nor could Devonshire himself, when he had cooled, think of it without vexation and shame. The government, however, with its usual folly, treated him so severely that in a short time the public sympathy was all on his side. A criminal information was filed in the king's bench. The defendant took his stand on the privileges of the peerage, but on this point a decision was promptly given against him, nor is it possible to deny that the decision, whether it were or were not, according to the technical rules of English law, was in strict conformity with the great principles on which all laws ought to be framed. Nothing was then left to him but to plead guilty. The tribunal had, by successive dismissions, been reduced to such complete subjection that the government which had instituted the prosecution was allowed to prescribe the punishment. The judges waited in a body on Jeffreys, who insisted that they should impose a fine of not less than thirty thousand pounds. Thirty thousand pounds, when compared with the revenues of the English grandees of that age, may be considered as equivalent to a hundred and fifty thousand pounds in the nineteenth century. In the presence of the Chancellor, not a word of disapprobation was tittered, but when the judges had retired, Sir John Powell, in whom all the little honesty of the bench was concentrated, muttered that the proposed penalty was enormous, and that one-tenth part would be amply sufficient. His brethren did not agree with him, nor did he, on this occasion, show the courage by which, on a memorable day some months later, he signally retrieved his fame. The Earl was accordingly condemned to a fine of thirty thousand pounds, and to imprisonment till payment should be made. Such a sum could not then be raised at a day's notice, even by the greatest of the nobility. The sentence of imprisonment, however, was more easily pronounced than executed. Devonshire had returned to Chatsworth, where he was employed in turning the old Gothic mansion of his family into an edifice worthy of Palladio. The Peak was in those days almost as rude a district as Connemara now is, and the sheriff found, or pretended, that it was difficult to arrest the lord of so wild a region, in the midst of a devoted household and tenantry. Some days were thus gained, but at last both the earl and the sheriff were lodged in prison. Meanwhile a crowd of intercessors exerted their influence. The story ran that the Countess Dowager of Devonshire had obtained admittance to the royal closet, that she had reminded James how her brother-in-law, the gallant Charles Cavendish, had fallen at Gainsborough, fighting for the crown, and that she had produced notes, written by Charles I and Charles the Second, in acknowledgment of great sums lent by her lord during the civil troubles. Those loans had never been repaid, and, with the interest, amounted, it was said, to more even than the immense fine which the court of King's Bench had imposed. There was another consideration which seems to have had more weight with the King than the memory of former services. It might be necessary to call a Parliament. Whenever that event took place, it was believed that Devonshire would bring a writ of error. The point on which he meant to appeal from the judgment of the King's Bench related to the privileges of peerage. The tribunal before which the appeal must come was the House of Peers. On such an occasion the court could not be certain of the support even of the most courtly nobles. There was little doubt that the sentence would be annulled, and that, by grasping it too much, the government would lose all. James was therefore disposed to a compromise. Devonshire was informed that, if he would give a bond for the whole fine, 
and thus preclude himself from the advantage which he might derive from a writ of error, he should be set at liberty. Whether the bond should be enforced or not would depend on his subsequent conduct. If he would support the dispensing power, nothing would be exacted from him. If he was bent on popularity, he must pay thirty thousand pounds for it. He refused, during some time, to consent to these terms, but confinement was insupportable to him. He signed the bond, and was let out of prison. But, though he consented to lay this heavy burden on his estate, nothing could induce him to promise that he would abandon his principles and his party. He was still entrusted with all the secrets of the opposition, but during some months his political friends thought it best for him, and for the cause, that he should remain in the background. End of Part 9